Time keeps on leaving and we keep on moving. When do we pass on our wisdom to the youth? My veteran story, lost ours discussions, fireside chats with the bourbon or two. It's time to hear the story by our military veterans. Get yourself ready. It's the Lost Arts Podcast. The Lost Arts with Andrew Cox. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Lost Art Podcast. That podcast has given a voice to our veterans. On today's episode, we continue our My Veteran Story with Navy veteran Doug Cooper. But before we get into the episode, are you enjoying the podcast? Then consider becoming a TLA patron. That's the Lost Art Patron. It is through donations that we are able to continue recording the podcast and getting our veteran voices out for all to hear. Just go to the Lost Art website and click on the Become a Patron link at the top. If becoming a TLA patron doesn't work for you and you would rather give a one-time donation, Then go to the Lost Art website and scroll down until you see the donation link. Any donation is appreciated. If you would like to be a guest on the podcast and tell your veteran story, then email me at thelostartwithandrewcox at gmail.com. All right, and we're back, coming back live with you with uh, Doug Cooper, Master Chief, retired uh, submariner. And he was telling us his story. Uh, we left off where he got an award for uh, breaking and entering into his own vehicle uh, to uh, get some luggage and some stuff for, um, who was it, Doug, that you got stuff that for? The, uh, that was the U.S. Ambassador, NATO Ambassador. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And uh, and you got the award for it, uh, which was absolutely incredible. <laughs> so uh, It was a memory, yeah. It was a good time. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's start there, and then uh, we'll just continue on. Uh, at, at that point, uh, you were coming up on your three years there, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, obviously, like I said, I'd gotten engaged to uh, to Joy. She was uh-huh. active duty Royal Navy, um, and so we we were attempting to get married. And you know, I'm overseas, and with security clearances and all that, you have to put in requests to get married. Yeah. And it was taking a long time. A long time um and i'm finally making phone calls and, and trying to figure out what well, what's the hold up mm-hmm. so, so i literally got a hold of the people in charge of this who were actually stationed at some place in england mm-hmm. it was kind of funny because I'm, I'm calling this american group that's in england that's in charge of these background checks to make sure <laughs> i'm okay marrying this foreign national in a foreign country right um and, and so I, i'm telling them that well you know it takes a while to do the background check that you know Betty Alshire Cooper, and I'm like, well, you do know that if you went two doors down in the same building you're at, knocked on their door and gave them her service number, they would tell you she has a higher clearance rating than I do. And they're like, well, you know, I know where you're at. And my wife is Royal Navy. She she yeah. worked in that building. You know, that she, she knows where you're at. So it was kind of funny, but neither said that dip, didn't actually happen. And both of us <laughs> ended up getting transferred back to, you know, I went to the States and she went back to England before yeah. our approval came through. So, oh, wow. So I'm now headed to, in theory, I'm headed to a a a, a um, boomer submarine out of Scotland, Holy Lock, Scotland. I had oh, orders wow. to go to Scotland, so okay. that was going to be cool. You know, she's still going to be active duty in the Royal Navy in, in England, and I'll be in Scotland, so not that far away. Mm-hmm. Um, so while I'm in Groton, Connecticut, waiting for these orders because that submarine is at sea on deployment, um, you know we. I went in and talked to my command there going, Hey, we, we want to get married. And, you know, and cause our home board was there and well, I have to request, you don't need a request to get married and you're in the States. I'm like, yeah, but she's a foreign national. That doesn't matter. I'm stationed in the States. So cool. So oh, we set wow. a date. Yeah. We're going to be married in April 18th. We're getting married in April. Good. Everything got approved. I got my leave approved. We're good. We set up for resorts. We paid the deposit for it. And mind you, we're paying this out of our pocket. They don't yeah. have any difference anybody paying this for us. So we're going to get married. And I got it. We In Arizona, we had already found where we wanted to go. So we paid the de- deposit for the resort, for the caterers, for the DJ, yeah. the photographer. Literally mailed out the invitations. The day after I mailed the invitations, 
I got called in and, oh, by the way, your orders just got changed. Oh, no. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. So we're sending you to the Holy Lock Scotland is closing. They're closing the base. Oh. So they sent me to a fast boat out of uh, Groton, Connecticut. And it, that was the uh, USS Pargo, okay. another fast boat. So I go and check in on the Pargo on a Monday morning. Mm-hmm. Okay, sorry about that. Oh. Um, so I go and check the Pargo on a on a Monday morning and talk to the XO and go, look, uh, I'm checking in. He, you know, what kind of what are we doing? And he's like, oops. And then because we're leaving on a six month deployment and we're going to be up under the ice and we're going to the North Pole and things uh, then I'm like, well, you know, hey, can I can I go on leave and I will pay my out of my pocket to fly to the first port and meet you? I got wedding date set. He's like, yeah, too bad. Uh, no, you don't. Uh, so I'm like, well, OK, can I take leave right now? And he's like, what? You just checked on board. Yeah, I'm going to go on leave. And he goes, what do you mean? I'm going to fly to England and get married. Um, we aren't leaving for a week and a half. I'll be back in a week. So Monday afternoon, I'm calling my wife in, which is Monday night, mind you, uh, in, in England. I'm calling her and saying, hey, change of plans. She's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm flying in. I have a flight. I arrive, you know, early Wednesday morning. So day and a half. I arrive Wednesday morning uh, in Heathrow. You need to come pick me up. I have to fly back on Sunday afternoon. Um, figure out how we get married in there. <laughs> She's like, what? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like, yeah, figure it out because my orders just got changed. So I did. We flew in. Um you know, and, and a lot of things that basically it, it turns out her, her actually her grandmother died that same day that I flew in. So I oh, said, well, no. I'm not doing this. And she says, no, her dad's like, no, no, we're doing this. You know, we can't change what it is. And this is what her, her grandmother would like. So we want. So, yeah, we got married and I flew back and I went to sea. Wow. <laughs> so and she's in England. So three months later, mind you, we're up. I'm on the I'm on the type of uh, old submarine that could go up underneath the polar ice cap. Yeah. Um, and so we were doing operations up underneath the North Pole and things, uh, which is, by the way, it's kind of cool. I've actually walked on the North Pole three times. It's kind of cool. Um, yeah, it's very cool. We've we played uh, uh, baseball and football with a Brit boat one of the times on the, on the North Pole. That's very cool. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool thing to see. The big, you know, we've been there both in the daylight hours and when it's, you know, darkness for whenever the time. It, that's yeah. kind of cool, too. But, huh. So I called her. Three months later, after we got married, I called her three months later, which, mind you, was the first time I got near a phone and that we were in like Adak, Alaska or something. Mm-hmm. And I called her and said, look, you know, we've been married for three months and we haven't had an argument yet. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I haven't talked to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, mind you, in those days, too, we did again, we didn't have Internet. We didn't have any of that. So you yeah. literally didn't have communications. <laughs> <laughs> and a six month deployment back in those days on a submarine, you were allowed. I mean, people could send you mail and you may or may not get the mail eventually. Yeah. Um, but they were allowed to send you what we called family grams. Uh-huh. Your family members could send you up to eight 50 word family grams in a six month period. Wow. So that's 400 words in six months. And those were radio messages. Basically, you had to take them into the squadron office and they would transmit them via radio if it was, you know, if we were an area or we could do that. Right. Um, now, mind you, of course, they read them. Two or three people read them. By the time they come in, your radio men read them, and then there's a supervisor or the boat read to make sure that you're not hearing it or getting told anything that you shouldn't be told. Right, yeah. You know, you know, dad died or something like that, which uh-huh. my wife learned very quickly after we were actually married and she was in the States, and she sent me one that, I got called to the captain's office for to ask me about a family member named Fred. I'm like, well, yeah, my wife's uncle's Fred. And then he was, well, you know, I'm sorry. I think we have some bad news, but it's kind of confusing. I'm like, okay. He goes, well, uh, apparently Uncle Fred, you know, has passed away. I'm like, oh, well, crap, that's bad. Um, yeah. But they buried him in the backyard. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so he lets me read this family gram, this, mind you. You could have 50 words. Yeah. That includes your name at the end and her name at the end. It, uh, Fred died buried in backyard. That's, I'm like, uh, now I start laughing, a, a captain. That, that's the guinea pig. Um, 
So, <laughs> so I told my wife, please never, ever, ever use the word diet again, please. Yeah, so don't do that. So no, we, I went out to the Pargo. So we had, um, you know, she's in this, she's in England. I'm in the States. So we try to arrange like once every six months, I would take leave and fly to England and uh-huh. the opposite three months, she would take leave and fly to America. So that basically we could try to see each other once every three months for, right. you know, maybe a week or so. Um, and we'd done that for two years. Um, which, you know, sometimes she would come over and I'd be working, you know, Uh 14 hour, 15 hour, 16 hour shift work or orders, you know, we're in a fast boat schedules change. So, Hey, you're here for three days, but guess what? We're going to see tomorrow. So Uh you're kind of on your own until you fly home. I would go over there and she would be locked in some tunnel underground for three or four days at a time doing whatever stuff she done, um, with her clearances. So. It was, it was something we done. We tried for two years, but in those days, again, um, if a female in the Royal Navy got pregnant, they would be kicked out of the Royal Navy because of a self inflicted injury. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. There was a lot of all that stuff, but that's all behind us. So we decided that, you know, we do want to have a family. One of us has to get out. So obviously it needed to be her because we couldn't have a family uh-huh. with her selected D. So we had to, once we decided that she decided, okay, I'm getting out of this date. Um, it was okay if, you know, if she got pregnant then because she's getting out. Yeah. So, so fortunately things work exactly the way they should. And, and she did. Mm-hmm. So she came to the States, um, pregnant, of course, cause that's the way it was. Um, yeah. moved to the States. I, of course, go to see two okay. weeks later. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you have a foreigner in Connecticut, uh, she is actually, you know, not a citizen. She is holding a green card, uh-huh. um, you know, registered alien. So I always told her I married an alien. Um, <laughs> so, but she was a legal alien. Let's put it that way. She's illegal. And we had green papers. Uh, anyway, so they went, so, uh, we went to see and, and so she was not afraid to, she learned quickly that American buses are not like European buses. Uh huh. She decided she would take a bus to Arizona and see my sisters. She didn't know what that would be like in America. My <laughs> wife will never ride an American bus again, ever. Trust me, ever. Yeah. It's so a long was, go. <laughs> oh, it's a long go and it's a very interesting go. Yes. Yeah. She had a lot of fun on that. But yeah. So, and then, um, obviously our son was born in, mm-hmm. in, uh, February of 93. And that's actually how I met you, as you know, my yeah, son. Yeah. Um, that's right. So then, um, so yeah, he was born in Groton, Connecticut. We went from Groton to, on the USS Pargo, and then I went and I decommissioned that boat actually, and then I oh, went wow. on to the USS Seahorse um, for her decommissioning. That was a short period, so it was like in '95. I was only there for like four or five months to decommission the boat. In oh, wow. decommissioning a nuclear world, they they needed that. You've already been through this. We need this because there's a lot of a lot of stuff when you're trying to get rid of the reactor and all mm-hmm. the you know, fuel rods and all that stuff. Yeah. So I went there, uh, and then. That was, we went from Groton to Bremerton, Washington. So again, we had gone from Groton. Now we're back over in Washington. Um, so we coast to coast, mm-hmm. uh, and went from Bremerton back to Italy. But this oh, time we wow. went to, um, Sardinia, to the island, uh, island of Sardinia off the coast. Mm-hmm. And there's a, at the time we had, the Navy had a small base there compound. Um, and we had a submarine tender ship. So a surface ship that basically was a, you know, mobile, um, repair facility for submarines that were oh, deployed to the Mediterranean. Yeah. So I was there and I ran the nuclear support facility on the tender. So any of the nuclear work they'd done, nuclear valves, any, you know, contamination work they needed done on subs that pulled into the med, that was our, our facility ran that because, you know, most of the, most of the other stuff, the people weren't nuclear trained and, you know, couldn't operate that part of the ship. So yeah, done that for, we had a good time there for, you know, three years. We, absolutely loved living we lived in sardinia which the little island actually the main island of sardinia is a pretty big island you have uh-huh. sardinia you have corsica you have sicily well we actually lived on a small island off the north coast of sardinia which is called la madalena la madalena is in the winter time and the off season months has i think it had a population of about eighteen thousand people um in the summertime, as in July and September, uh-huh. it would go up to about 80,000 people. Oh, um, that's oh, a it's, drastic change. Oh, it's a, it, this is the land of um, big money vacation spots. You are, 
it's an archipelago, you know, island. It is literally absolutely one of the most beautiful places on earth. Wow. And we live there. The Navy, we tell people, and the Navy pays us to live here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, I mean, again, we're eating absolutely fantastic Italian food. Mm -hmm. We're traveling the country. Of course, now to get to the mainland Italy for us, you have to take a, from the island of Madalena, you have a ferry that gets you over to the mainland of Sardinia. Uh -huh. It's about a 25 minute ferry ride. And then you have to drive down the coast to get to one of the big cities in Sardinia to take another ferry across to Rome or to the back, you know, um, or up north, uh -huh. or you can fly. So wow. it was literally planes, trains, and automobiles to get anywhere <laughs> um, in ferry boats. But we, we lived there and it was, we loved living there. I mean, the people and the food, it just, the piazza, when they say you go to the piazza there, it is literally a community. We, you know, our son, we moved there and Ian, our son was maybe two, mm -hmm. um, just if he wasn't quite two when we first got there. And, and I'll always remember, you know, I'm out, I'm out on the boat working on, and mind you, the boat is on another island. So I had to take a ferry or a Navy boat actually to work every day. Oh, wow. So, oh, yeah. You're in a small little island. So this was a fun little thing. Um, so she's we lived pretty close to the main piazza. So it was like a block and a half walk and everybody walks there. It's it's a small island. Yeah. Um, so she's coming down with a little stroller and our son's in the stroller. And she said, this guy comes out of a bar. Now, bars over there are, yes, they serve alcohol. But during the day, it's coffee. It's, uh -huh. it's a coffee bar. You say yeah. bar, it's mostly the coffee bar. And this this old Italian gentleman walks out and just grabs him out of the stroller and takes him into the bar. And she's like kind of freaking out going, this, this man just stole my child. Look, it's because he's this little blonde haired blue eyed child, male child. And they're yeah. taking him in and buying him ice cream and candy and whatever he wants. Oh, and, and you think a young child doesn't figure that out real quick? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that son, that, that boy was spoiled rotten because yeah, he would go into the little baker shop every morning and they'd give him his free bread rolls. He would give free candy on the corner of the coffee shops. Uh, yeah. When he was learning how to ride a bicycle in the piazza, it's just a big, huge, you know, park basically, but it's all, you know, um, cobblestones and things. There are trees and things. So he would have his little training wheels and he was learning how to ride a bike. Well, we'd sit with our friends and drink coffee. We could see him. He's uh -huh. fine. Nobody, kids are fine there. Nobody's going to hurt a child, yeah. but this, he would fall over on the bike. And he quickly figured out that if he lays there for just a second, some little Italian is going to run over and grab him and pick him up and take him in and get him some ice cream because, oh, my gosh, you got hurt. <laughs> and stare at us because we're the bad parents, mind you, because obviously we're not, you know, baby. Yeah. Oh, but like, we're not. He's not hurt. He just is using this. He would literally fall over on purpose. So we love living there. But we left we left there. Um, he went to Italian school. He actually went to Italian school from three to five, and he literally was fluent in Italian when we left there at five years old. Wow. We went, left there and went back to Groton, Connecticut um, uh, to be on the, where did we go? I think we went to the La Jolla and went up to Kittery, Maine. Yeah, went to Maine and the La Jolla. Uh, and then we ended up going back to Italy to be on squadron duty. Um, I was on the, on the tender again, but I was part of the squadron staff. So we were basically taking care of all the submarines that came into the Mediterranean. Yeah. So and at this point, that, what rank are you at this point? I was a chief. I made chief when I was on the tender. Um, actually, I made chief just before when we, like when I told you, my master said, get back on your boat, you make chief. Yeah. yeah she wasn't wrong. At first selection board, I made it, but I didn't, you know, I just barely put it on and went back over to run the nuclear support facility. Right. And then I went back to the, the tender and, that's when I picked up senior chief. Um, so as E8. And so we're going around and I left there, went to, oh, where did we go? From, yeah, squadron. And then, um, actually while I was at squadron, I, I picked up master chief and, oh, and I'll tell you, there was, and, and I told you kind of briefly when I started this, how my family situation was when mm -hmm. I started out, which is kind of how it got there. And, and it took me, I'm fortunate, I'm old now, I'm 63 years old. So, yeah. but I wasn't, quite as yeah, I didn't have things figured out as much then, mm -hmm. even though I've been in a while, I will tell you, yeah, I had problems. I had, I had, I had some mental issues that are PTSD related, but they're not, you know, war PTSD related. Yeah. They're, they're more family. And, and that's, you know, and I had, I had my issues with that. And, mm -hmm. um, 
is so which which is what I found it, you know, that the military and, and this is this is a downside for me and and, and I have but it's the truth is is my truth anyways, uh-huh. is that you know, I did I got to a pretty low point. I had some low points where you know, I, I had friends, but you, you only allow friends to get so close because yeah. you just know that they're going to betray you because well that's that's what you know my mother has done, that's what my father has done. This is this yeah. is my life. So, and, and I, but I didn't know that's what I was doing at the time. And I would just, you know, you get friends close and then you just, you're the one that causes the issue to drive everything away. Right. But I got pretty low and, and I finally did, I finally got to a point when I was there at, at squadron staff and it was just before I made my chief, I think that I, I finally had gone into, I had a good friend who was a corpsman as the senior chief. And I was like, look, I need help and help. You gotta, you know, I need help Yeah. because I'm. Uh, I knew where I was at mentally and it was not where I needed to be bad. I was, I was, you couldn't get much lower basically. Yeah. So, uh, and I did, I did, they did actually, you know, send me over, over to Naples Italy and uh, for a few days to see, you know, and t- talk to, you know, psychiatrist or whatever it was over there. Um, <sighs> there's good and bad in that. Yeah. Um, the bad side, I will say, at least in my line of work, it, it, it isn't, what they always say, and, and I, I, I honestly know, and, and it's not a belief, I do know that it is better now, but then, yes, they will give you the help, but they will hold it against you. Yeah. Um, career business. And that was the, so I knew why people didn't ask for help. Yeah. And that was the sad part. So that was, again, as we got more senior and as we've done more, that gave us, these are the things we work on. This is what we do because our job is, you know, we don't have a job without our people. So that was what we had right. to do is make sure we take care of them. Uh-huh. Um, and things happen and sometimes people need help. So I went through that. I did go through that. And, and I do know now that the programs are there because, you know, everybody says, well, PTSD, you weren't in a war. Well, okay. We've been on submarines that have been, I, I've been there where, you know, we're getting depth charged, but those are, those are, those are the kind of things I've left out of my story and where we're at. Yeah, because where we were and, you know, submarines were the silent service and where we were and what we could done. Yeah, I still can't really necessarily say where we right. were, and what we've done and why we've done it, uh-huh. because that's still part of our operations as far as I know. And that's the way it'll stay. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it, there there's some things out there and it can be really rough, especially when you're separated from your family all the time, uh-huh. um, you know my son barely seen me. I was gone all the time. I, yeah. I was always gone. So, you know, the fact that he grew up like he did is amazing. Um, but he also grew up in a pretty strict household. But so we, I made master chief while I was there though. Things, you know, I, I got my head on and I have since figured those things out. That's how I know I can say I have trust issues. I knew what that was. Now I can pinpoint it and the life's a lot easier. Right. But, um, yeah, I left there and we came back to the USS Maine. And I don't know if you see a, a, a thing here, but this is 26 years of service by the time I got out. I had one shore duty and that was when I was a first class, an E6. Yeah, and they that's right. Everything else the time was you're deployed. deployed. Was like, see. I was deployed, yeah. yeah. Normal rotation, that is not normal rotation. Normally you're you're you know going to see then you're on a shore duty and things, but every time it was, you know, shore duty time, it was, hey, you're, you know, this is what you do engineering, you're good at what you do. We need you to go to this boat. They've had a problem. We need you to take over the ship's engineering and, and you know fix this basically. Right. Yeah. So that that's kind of how that worked out. I ended up coming here to um, Kittery or to Kings Bay, Georgia, which is where we wanted to be. We wanted to come down here. Um, the thought process was I got here. It was I was at like 20, whatever it was, uh, 24 years, I think, when I got here. I was yeah. 24 years in. I was a mass chief. Obviously, I'm not ever going to be promoted again. I'm at the, I, where, yeah. where do you go from there? So, um, and when they asked me to take another boat, I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll do that. That's a three-year tour. Um, we'll do the three years, and then I'll follow that on with three years shore duty right there in Kings Bay, and that'll take me to 30. Yeah. Life will be good. And they agreed. That's, that's what we'll do. Well, of course, I got here. <laughs> and... uh I was only here for three months and I found out, oh, by the way, the boat that they're sending you to is actually changing home port and it's going to Bremerton, Washington. Oh my gosh. I'm like, hold on. That, that's no, because when we got here, I tell my wife, okay, you've now chased me from coast to coast, overseas, back and forth. Literally, we went from overseas to the States back to, back overseas in 22 months. Yeah. Um, you know, 
that's expensive on the family and hard on the family. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but she done it all. She, you know, she was on Budsman, commanded on Budsman three times. So she was right there with me every step of the way. Uh-huh. Um, so, but uh, I had told her when we got here, we'll come here, we'll have this job and, and you can actually get, you know, she wanted a career, not a job because she always worked. That's what she does. Yeah. Um, and she said, okay, I'm, I'm going to get a career. This is, and I said, all right, we're going to be here six years. We're not, you know, I won't uproot you again in two. Well, uh-huh coming home and saying, uh, guess what? <laughs> We're moving. And that's when we, that's the first time we ever considered me doing the, the geo bachelor thing where I go and leave them here. Yeah. And that's, we were in that discussion phase when, uh, unfortunately a standard routine procedure at the, the Naval hospital, uh, kind of went bad, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, it two basically, and that was just months after we got here. And so they spent the next two years pretty much trying to fix whatever this problem was. Hmm. You know, they'd done cardiac catheterizations on me. They did a lot of things trying to figure out what was wrong. It turned right. out that it was damage that they had caused this procedure. Hmm. But um, unfortunately, the the two years worth of let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. So the last let's try was a different drug than they had been trying and some of the other things. And then, you know, my Typically, response was, you know, it's a 40 minute drive down to this hospital. Yeah. I'd go down. They're going to do this. They're going to do this. And I'd call my corpsman and say, Doc, that's what they're doing. <laughs> Keep him informed. Well, I, it was a Friday afternoon. I called Doc, got his cell phone, and I messed their voicemail and I read the silly name off this drug bottle and I just read it and said, This is what we're trying this time. Well, my corpsman called me back a few hours later and said, You know, Bull, because that's what he called me. I was the Bull Nuke, the senior nuke on board. And he's like, mm-hmm. Bull, tell me you didn't take that. And I'm like, Well, what do you mean? Of course I took that. The captain gave it to me. Oh, you know, no. I was a captain. I'm in, I'm in, and I'm in uniform every time I do this. So I'm wearing my submarine dolphins. He knows I'm a submariner. Yeah. Um, and he's like, you, you can't, this conversation never took place. We'll just wait for the squadron doctor to hear this. I'm like, no, no, that's not the way this is going to work. You're going to tell me what's <laughs> going on. Yeah. And he's like, you're done. I'm like, uh, what do you mean I'm done? And he's your submarine disqualified. Whoa. Medical disqualified. You cannot take that medicine. It's submarine disqualifying immediately. I'm like, well, I won't take it anymore. It doesn't matter. If you've taken one, you are submarine disqualified medically. You cannot be in a submarine because wow. it was some sort of psychotropic drug. Needless to say, it was probably a good, I- good idea that, you know, he didn't answer the phone while I was still in the parking lot of the hospital. Yeah. Um, yeah. That probably would have gone over really well. Um, so at that point, you know, frustration and just, just basically flat out being mad. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll admit it. I was mad. Um, you know, I'm, here's a job I've been doing for 26 years that I've just lost because somebody else didn't do theirs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I could have done shore duty or whatever. And I was, I was just mad. I said, you know what? It's 26. I'm not getting ever promoted again because I'm already an E9. Mm-hmm. A 26 is the last big pay raise, as you know. Yeah. Um, so after that, and I was on, you know, I wasn't on high three retirement. I was on last day pay retirement. So oh, uh, yeah. I'm like, nope, you know what? 26 is enough. It's time for retirement. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, I always, always said I was doing 30 and I always still, that was, you know, it'd be 18 years in March. It'd be 18 years ago that I retired and I still regret not hitting 30. Mm -hmm. But I look at the, the point in which I retired, everything happens for a reason. The point at which I retired was just as our son was going to high school. Mm -hmm. So for those four years that I would have been still, you know, working God awful hours or whatever. Yeah during his high school year, I was there. I was able to be part of what he needed during high school. Oh yeah. So, absolutely. so that it worked out for the best. Um, but it was, it was, that's, so that was my last duties. But, um, there was, there was a story that I do need to add back when yeah. we were in, at this, when we last time we were in Italy and I was in squadron staff uh-huh. and I told you that my wife was, was an alien. She was a legal alien. Mm-hmm. We tried, uh, the first time we tried for her citizenship, we were stationed in Italy. That was our first stationing in Italy. Uh, well, obviously we met in Italy, but our first time we got stationed being married in Italy, you know, we'd filed all the paperwork and it's not easy and nor is it cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, filed it all. And of course my home record was Arizona. So we're filing it through Arizona for her citizenship hearing. Right. And they, we do all this paperwork and the packages are pretty lengthy and involved and, and, we got it all in finally, and we got 
our little letter from what at the time was INS is Immigration Naturalization Service, not mm -hmm. ICE like it is today. Yeah. Got the letter. Here's my appointment date, you know, in Phoenix, this date, whatever it was. So take leave. The three of us fly back to Arizona. And of course, there's a long line and you're standing outside in the Arizona heat for a few hours and you get in the building and you show them your little letter and you, know, you fill the paperwork. Here's your address. Well, I'm giving them my FPOAE address because this uh -huh. is where I live in Italy. Well, what's what's your street address? So I gave him my street address and she's <laughs> like, that's that's Italy. <laughs> y yes. What you're not living in the States. No, I'm active duty military, but my home record is this address right here. You know, yeah. about 30 miles from here. No, but you're not living here. N no, I'm active duty military. I'm overseas. <laughs> so, but you have to be in the States to do this. You sent the appointment letter to my overseas address. <laughs> yes, but you can't do this. You have to be living in the States. Wow. And I'm like, I'm active duty military and I have to be living in the States. Turns out this person was wrong, by the way. But you can't argue with INS. That yeah. person yeah, yeah, holds yeah. all the cards. So literally, we had flown all the way to the States for her citizenship and had to fly back. Oh, my gosh. And with the orders to refile when you get back. Now, we found out later that this person was wrong, but what are you going to do? Yeah. So so we refiled later. Well, we were in Maine. Of course, we weren't expecting to be turned back overseas within 22 months. So that package was null and void because we didn't get the appointment while we were still in States. Oh, my gosh. So the third attempt, though, we had it in writing we were allowed as active duty overseas so the third attempt was <clears throat> in 2001 uh -huh. um, we filled all the paperwork out again and our appointment at the state department office was going to be through boston okay on september 15th of 2001 mm -hmm. so what happened on september 11th of 2000 oh my gosh yeah yeah oh yeah. man my wife's parents were flying from England on September 11th to Italy to come and watch our son because he wasn't going to go with us this time. We were just going to go and do it and, and get her citizenship hearing. They were in the air, of course, when all that took place. Um, and I'm the, we are the only ones from, I'm working at squadron staff. Well, uh -huh. squadron had deployed. We had half of them on a submarine. The other half were on a tender ship going over to the mainland of Italy. I was left behind because I was going on leave for this. So yeah. in squadron is, you know, the senior, you know, basically position on that Island. We did have a small Navy compound, but squadrons over them. So yeah. as being squadron duty officer, I'm basically the senior as a senior chief at the time, uh -huh. I was the senior Navy person on the Island. Holy and my God. wife was the squadron ombudsman. So when all this took place, the, uh, Admiral's office from Maine and Italy is calling her and telling her, you know, hey, this is what you need to get on the, the Armed Forces Radio Television Network. This is what you need to say. This is what you need to put out. Yeah. So she's doing that. Um, you know, we're sitting trying to figure out what's going on, you know, because obviously we're living in a foreign country. We don't know what's going on. The security levels just went crazy, of course, over there. Uh -huh. um, so obviously all flights were shut down. We did get her parents in. We're there. We're trying to figure out what are we doing? Well, we're trying to fly via Milan to come to the States. Right. Well, our state, our flight from Sardinia to Milan still happened. So what we've got, it, you know, making phone calls, we, everything's closed, trying to get anybody in an, in an INS office, <laughs> you know, in between the 11th and the 15th to answer yeah. a phone. It was not happening very well. I finally got a person on a phone that was somewhere in New Hampshire. Um, and I'm like, look, this is my appointment date. This is, you know, obviously we can't get there right now. Well, the person first told me, well, can you take a boat? And I'm going, excuse me? Well, the plane's not riding. Can you take a boat? I'm going, you, you do realize that I'm in Italy and this is too, no, you, no, I don't, no, yeah. I can't take the boat in two days. It doesn't work. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. Um, and then they're like, so, well, and like, if I get there and the you know, State Department's closed, what happens? Well, you'll have to refile. Oh you won't just give me a new appointment. You have to refile. Yes. Okay, so if I can't get there because there's no flights, you'll have to refile. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. So we were in Milan and couldn't get any flights. Everything is shut down. There's people in this airport that have been there, you know, since it's over two days, three yeah. days. 
and they're they're still in the airport. It, it's a madhouse like the rest of the world was. Uh-huh. Um, so we stood in the airport for hours, and we finally said, "This just is not happening. Let's get a flight back to Sardinia." And we're walking through the airport, obviously a little disgruntled. Um, and some little Alitalia flight attendant comes around to a group of us that were standing in the corner, and she's like, "Look." They're opening a flight to Newark, New Jersey, on that terminal over there. Any ticket for anywhere in the States, first come, first serve, they'll take you. Oh, wow. So we got in that line. We felt a little bit bad that, you know, some people have been in the airport for like three days, and we've only been there for a few hours, but we got in that line, and we got on that plane. Sat on the tarmac for hours, but we did actually get, we flew in to Newark, New Jersey on the 14th, I think. It could have been the 15th. I'm not okay. sure exactly the date now. I don't remember because our dates were changed. But um, you could still see the smoke coming from the towers. Wow. American flags were hanging at every overpass on the freeway. Of course, we got uh-huh. we picked up we were in a car, and that was sorry, but we went for her. Said and the State Department was was open. Wow. I think we ended up there on the 18th. Is what we ended up finally getting in on the 18th. And to get into any of those buildings, of course, security was crazy. Uh-huh. Um, and they're you know, searching everything, shoes off, everything, conveyor belts, you know, for yeah. you know, much laying. And apparently the security guard who was in charge of that little conveyor belt area was obviously ex-military uh-huh. because I wasn't stupid. I showed up in uniform. I went yeah. in uniform and um, in my full dress. And then the guys, Senior Chief, what do you got? I'm like, oh, okay, he knows the military. Um, I said, well, it's my wife's appointment letter. Okay. And then he just turns to the guy running the conveyor belt and he says the senior chief and his wife are good. So we start to put our stuff up there and he's like, nope, you're good. So we didn't even get scanned or nothing. He just let oh, us wow. in. My wife went through her interviews. Um, you have to do interviews. You have to do oral and written English exams, uh-huh. which was kind of funny because I'm looking at the lady going, you do realize that they invented the language, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. But she says, yes, I, I get it. But she was really nice. And because, again, everybody's every just nice to the military at that point. It was yeah. so different to see. It was a little eerie. But, um, you know, while she's back taking her tests, I'm sitting in this room watching, you know, other people back then they'd come out after their interview or their tests. And, and then pretty soon somebody would come out and tell them, okay, you passed your test. You're mm-hmm. swearing. And this is, again, September. You're swearing in will be in january or you know i'm like oh for god's sakes we're gonna have to come back months from now this is ridiculous yeah my mind is saying this well my wife comes out waiting on her tests and the lady comes out and we're sitting in this room full of people of course and comes out and uh, mrs cooper you've you passed all your exams and everything's good if you don't mind not having all the pomp and circumstance you know in the photo we the judge will swear you in in about a half an hour Wow. Yes, we'll do it because um, we realize that you know, you've got to get back to your job. Your husband has to get back to the job. Yeah. And of course, it was funny, but it's pretty funny. Some other lady sitting close by goes, "Well, I want mine today." And it was pretty funny to watch that lady tell her to sit down and shut up because she wasn't in uniform. It was pretty funny, <laughs> uh, but uh, it was good. It was a good time. So my wife literally got her got sworn in just literally days after that, and uh, we went back and. Back to the states, they were sitting there going, "Okay, well, all through all that, you know." And I'm sitting here going, "You, you really?" And part of me was saying, "This is what's happening to my country, and you, you want to, you want to give up your citizenship for this?" Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Wow. But so obviously, uh, we know. But obviously, our son was already born. When our son was born, my wife was not a citizen. Um, yeah. So you know, we registered his birth with the British embassy also when he was born in Connecticut um, to make sure that if anything happened to me, that, you know, she, you know, he still has citizenship. And and so he had dual citizenship because, you know, if if anything would have happened to me while she was still just a green card holder, Uh they could have sent her back to England or, you know, she had no rights. So, yeah, so we know about the immigration stuff going on but we we know it we obviously have a different tune than a lot of people because we've lived it we've done it and we we know the yes it's hard legally but there's a way there's routes there's oh, easy yeah. things to do this so that, that you know when we that's one of those subjects but yeah i just look at that going yeah we we were there and overseas when all that happened and it's a whole new aspect but you see the whole world come together yeah we had the, t- the support we had from the Italians and everything over there, everybody was just, they couldn't do enough for us at the time. Wow. And you, 
well, you, you lived through that too. You've seen the way the Americans treated each other then. Oh yeah. The yeah. military. Well, that's not there anymore, but and we had a good time. So no, we, so all that happens and we retired here, um, had a good retirement ceremony here and, um, in, well, my ceremony was in September of 05, but I didn't officially retire until March of 06. Okay. That was because the boat I was on was actually leaving and going to Bremerton, like I said. So mm-hmm. we had my retirement ceremony and that's, I had my job all lined up. I'm going to go work it on the refit facility here for the submarines and work in the nuclear uh, quality assurance. And, nice. but I really didn't want to do it. I didn't, I mean, it was one of those, it's nuclear stuff. I'm tired. It's 26 years. I don't want to do nuclear. Yeah. And, uh, my wife was a realtor and she's one of those realtors that, you know, her clients are her clients forever, uh-huh. uh, her friends and, you know, things would go wrong in houses like they do, you know, uh-huh. you can buy a house tomorrow and in a week from now, something breaks and yeah. people are panicking and they would call her and, you know, it's not her problem, but most of the time she'd be like, if I was around, she's like, Hey, can you go out here with me and see if we can find out what the problem is? Uh-huh. Well, I need you to go out there and within minutes, I'm usually telling her, well, this is the problem. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is it. And she's, I'm like, didn't you have this house inspected? And she's like, well, yeah. I'm like, well, this isn't rocket science. They should have found this. This is, <laughs> this is, you know, it's not what I do, but it is what I do. I mean, I yeah. inspect something. This, you know, and I think that's when she told me, well, you're just an anally retentive nuke. And this is what you should be doing. You should be inspecting houses because that's what you do. Yeah. So that's how I got in. I decided, sure. I'll give up the job on base, which obviously was a lot of good money and a lot of that mm-hmm. benefits and started my own business um, mm-hmm. when I got out as a home inspector and Very it's nice. still going and it's, it's treated us well. I mean, we travel a lot. We do. That's that's what we do all the time now. So we travel. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we do now. And we live here. And as you know, um, our son, uh, done really well in high school. He went to college as a music. Well, he was always going to be a marine biologist. I mean, the kid grew up in the Mediterranean. He lived yeah. in the water constantly. He was in marine biology until his sophomore year of high school, I think. Uh-huh. And he came home and told us, hey, mom and dad, I want to talk to you. I, 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 I don't want you to be mad at me, but I think I'm going to change my major. And I'm like, okay, what do you want to do? He says, I want to, I want to be in music. I'm like, well, I could be mad at you, but I, I, I'm going to tell you the truth that, you know, um, do what you love while you can do it. But at some point you have yeah. to do something that pays the bills. And, um, that's hard in music. It's really yeah, hard. To pay the bills in music. Yeah. So at, like we always say, he always finds a way. <laughs> he finds a way. Yeah. Yep. So he auditioned, as you know, he auditioned yeah. for the Navy band program and he got in and done that for those four years. That's how he met you. And and yeah. you made an impact on him. Obviously there's, there's, you I made a, say I had a blast, uh, when he was there, I phenomenal musician, uh, I just incredible. I wish I could play like he could, but, um, while he he's was just there, a, yeah, go ahead. He's just a good person. I look at that and oh, go, yeah, his level headedness and the things mm-hmm. he does, I'm going, I, I, I didn't have that when I was his age. Oh yeah. I was yeah. the hothead. I agree with that. Yeah, that's he's very level headed. Um but when he when he came through, uh I don't even know how it came up, but he had mentioned that you were a master chief. Uh so at that point that's when I started calling him Master Chief. And yeah, he told uh, me about that. Yeah. And then all the chiefs got upset because I was yep. calling him Master Chief. And of course yeah. I didn't care. Yeah. I was like, whatever. Uh yeah. but they all came down, oh you gotta stop calling him that and I'm like no, no, that's his name. That's what I'm calling him. And uh, even the the master chief that was there, he came down. He's like, "Why do you call him that?" And I was like, "Oh, his dad's a master chief." He goes, "Oh, okay." And I was like, "And, and he goes, oh, I, I guess I sh- shouldn't give him a, that much of a hard time anymore." And I was like, "No, no, no, just keep doing no, it. It's okay." Just keep doing it. It's character building. It's yeah. character building. But I remember he came up to me. He's like, "Gunny, can can you please stop calling me master chief?" I'm like. <laughs> No, I can't. I no. can't do that. Okay. That's that's who you are. <laughs> well, you know, he um, he, yeah, he made that phone call when he was in boot camp. He called me and he's like, "No, oh, Dad, I owe you an apology." I'm like, "Why?" He goes, "Well, you were a master chief, and I never appreciated that." I'm like, "What do you mean?" Goes, well, that's a big deal. I'm like, "Oh, well, not really." And he's like, "No, it's a big deal." 
because he didn't pay attention to the military. We didn't yeah. bring that home. We didn't we, we didn't play rank games. We had friends that were at all ranks, and yeah, we did, and we didn't do that. Um, so I had to tell him. I said, well, you know what, what rank is for you? This is what rank is. Rank gives you a better paycheck, so you can take care of your family better, uh-huh. and it gives you the ability to take care of your people better. I said, that's what rank does for you. As soon as you get more rank, you have more ability to take care of the people that work for you. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. That says, because you don't make rank on your own. That says, I'm sorry, I don't care oh, how good yeah. you are. Oh, yeah. You do not make rank because you were good. You made rank because somebody underneath of you done their job properly. Mm-hmm. That's the way yeah. that works. Yeah. Um, so we had those conversations. And of course, you know, he, he wanted to, he done that for four years and was good. And he, he loved it. He loved playing while he was playing he loved entertaining you know the schools mm-hmm. the orphanages and those things that he would done yeah but he wasn't being challenged mm-hmm. the music he was playing as you know a lot of the times they play but they're going to play to young kids they're going to play the pop songs the kids the things the kids know oh yeah well yeah. you know he was he was hardcore jazz oh that's yeah. him he's yeah. old school hardcore jazz very good he I mean he's been on stage twice with Delfeo marcellus in new orleans he's good at what he does yeah. So he was a little disgruntled in that, he, and and some and I don't know he, what he ever spoke to you about, but he yeah he told me a little he had some leadership things over there that you know he had called and say Dad what do I do and I'm like well you know at one point I just I'm like, the first time in your life I'm going to tell you to just keep your mouth shut because <laughs> you've told your senior person now mm-hmm. it's not on you anymore because the things that were going on shouldn't have been going on and and no. he didn't like it well you're the junior man you can't fix it yeah. You know, that one of those things so but it was all it was all good um but when he you know he got his commission and i tell you that that was absolutely phenomenal when he decided he wanted to be an officer and and to be there to give him his first salute um that's cool yeah that was really cool well there was a picture when when i retired and i it's still right here right above me right now i'm sitting here looking at it in my office um when i retired i'm God, I looked a whole lot better in those days. Anyways, um, <laughs> there he is at whatever, 10 years old, um, you know, so, uh, 13 maybe, uh, whatever. It was 06. He's, so, yeah, he's 13. Um, and he's in his T-shirt. And we're standing in our front yard, and I'm in my choker whites, full yeah. dress medals, and we're doing this back-to-back arm cross pose standing in our front yard, and somebody just snapped the picture. Yeah. Well, we love that picture. So I sent him. A copy of this when he was in the boot camp. Okay. Yeah. Well, that got him in some, you know, fun too, because they look at all your mail and they see, oh, dad's a master chief there too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so, um, so I told him we're going to repeat this picture at your boot camp graduation. So he's in his whites and I'm in my whites. Very um, cool. We repeated the picture at boot camp. Yeah. So of course, when he got commissioned, like we're doing it again. Very so, cool. So I have all three of them in a little frame together. And I told him one more time, one more time, it will happen. When you retire, we'll do it again. Yeah. So, so that's that's our goal. We will do that one more time. And I told him I will still fit in that dang uniform. And then, but, uh, <laughs> I can still wear it. Uh, it's been a struggle a couple of times, but uh, I can still wear that uniform. That's awesome. So, yeah, it's uh, he's doing good. But I tell you, when he went... When he went to officer candidate school, I had I had a conversation with him, and I you know I told him you're going to get you're going to be in positions, and you know I've never really talked about that kind of stuff with him. I said you know they're, they're, the questions they're going to ask you, they're always going to you know the questions. Well, what is leadership to you? What is this? Mm-hmm. And I said you know you're going to get that silly question of in one word, what is leadership? Yeah. And, and I so I'm like and I will tell and I tell and I'm going to tell you what what I've learned over my years in one word, what is leadership? It's influence. Mm, One good. Yeah. Influence. And he's like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, influence. I said, it can be good. It can be bad. And leadership can be good. It can be bad. Mm-hmm. It's influence. Yeah. That is leadership. Um, and it tells you to think about it. Well, when he graduated boot, um, from OCS, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever, we told him when he went up there, just keep your head down and get through there because it's going to be hard you're going to get picked on and you know yeah. you, you know basically they're going to they're going to ride you because that's what their job is uh-huh. keep your head down just do your job and get out of there well of course that's not him yeah he you know within a couple of weeks well i'm in this leadership group i'm in this leader you know every two <laughs> weeks they change and i'm in this leadership group but he ends up being the assistant commodore yeah so basically he's number two of their class for the last part so at their graduation i guess they're 
the, the girl who was the Commodore, the, the young sailor, or, well, she's an ensign, um, mm -hmm. just didn't want to speak or didn't, whatever, I don't know. But so it was on him. He ended up giving the, the class speech. Oh, no kidding. Which he didn't tell us anything about what he was doing. But of course we went and we're mm -hmm. sitting in the room and, and he, in his speech, he starts talking about things and he goes, well, I, you know, he said somebody, you know, I, I make myself cry here, but um, he said somebody, you know, that I respected told me about leadership. And one yeah. word, and that's when he brought that up, you know, and he, hell, he remembered. That's what he told me. Like he used that in his speech, and I'm like, holy crap. That's so, really cool. But it was, yeah, that's when I realized that this kid is a lot smarter than me. Yeah. And he's a lieutenant now, so he's uh, out there he's doing wonderful things. Stuff. Yeah, he's he's yeah. out there. And he's he's doing good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's doing great. The family, he's got a family. We've got two grandbabies now. Yeah. We live life. Uh, we, my wife and I are both winding our businesses down um, a lot. Our goal now is to be traveling at least one week out of every month. Yeah. Um, people look at us like, are you ever home? Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. We have an RV and we cruise and we go visit the grandbabies. We go here, we go there. We yeah. You know, we have found out that there's a lot of people in my family and friends that are our age or just barely older that are, you know, having medical issues that are people that are doing things. And we're like, nope, live life while you can. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. not about what you have in the bank at the end of the day. If my bills are paid, I don't need, to, you know, bad mm -hmm. accounts. My son doesn't need my money. He's doing fine on his own. Yeah. So our job is to live life and. As we tell people, people are like, well, what are you escaping? And, and somebody actually said that to us and we thought, and then I found the actual words written by somebody else because I'm not that smart. Mm -hmm. And it says, I don't, we don't travel to escape life. We travel so life does not escape us. Ooh, and I'm like, good. you know what? That, that hit me in that that's, that's what we do. We're yeah. going, we're living. And so we're, I will say that the military and I will, we love it. We, we, you know, my job, I, I'm always being told, well, your prices, you, you, you don't charge enough. Your prices are too low. And, yeah. and I'm like, well, you know, 90% of my clients are still, we're in, we're in a military town. 90% of my clients are still military. Yeah. Most of those are, you know, younger sailors and things. You know, they're senior ones too. But I, know, I was talking, my, my job as a master chief was to take care of my sailors. Mm -hmm. That's, and I, that job hasn't changed. Yeah. So that's true. Do, I need, do I need an extra $100 from them or something? I don't need it. Mm -hmm. Of course, it'd be nice. But no, no, my job hasn't changed. As long as I'm comfortable, uh, my bills are paid. So that we still live in a military town. We, that's what we do every day. That's what yeah. my wife does every day because she uses all her experiences to help all of her clients. And mm -hmm. so we loved what we done. There's a lot of, were there bad things? Oh, of course there were, but you know, I really <laughs> don't remember most of those. Honestly, yeah. I don't remember most of them because mm -hmm. I had to tell myself when I got to those low, low spots, those things had to go. They yeah. had to go. Yeah. Yeah. Very it's true. too easy. It's too easy. Now, you know, it, it's happened. I've, I've had my fight with the VA uh, for mm -hmm. many years, um, and things went pretty badly with some injuries, and 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 I, again, I got to that low spot again. But mm -hmm. it, I found someone I could talk to and fix that, and that worked. So very nice. Yeah. So and, you know, that's a that's a good thing, a good point that you bring up, like. Uh, you know, some, some veterans, you know, they have a hard time, uh, expressing it or whatever, and they don't want to go see somebody and stuff like that. You know, and I always try to encourage people cause I, I kind of had the same type of stuff, uh, I, you know, dealing with issues that I've had in the past or whatever. And I found, I, I went and saw a, a therapist and I not, cause I always thought, ah, you know, that's nothing and it won't help or whatever. And then it, it honestly does it, or it has for me, it helped me. Uh, I yeah. won't say it fixed everything necessarily, but no. it's definitely no. helped me for sure. If it just helps you understand. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. it, you know, that understanding isn't, as my wife will clearly tell people, it isn't going to stop my reaction sometimes. True. But it's going to fix it a lot faster than it yeah. would have before because yeah. certain things are still going to happen. But no, my help didn't come, unfortunately, from the Navy. And I will, I, look, I'll tell you, I'll tell the story because if it helps somebody else, I, mm -hmm. I had, it was after I got out, but I had, it, was, it was Navy related and, and work related. I had um, an injury to my hand and my foot and it had gotten bad. 
Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, my doctor, of course, was on base still because that's where we are. Our, our yeah. primary care was on base, even as retirees. And and I if I had gone in and I tell him, look, you know, if I got my hand in, if I can barely move my hand, mm-hmm. and my foot was getting bad, and then nobody, well, they take X-rays and tell me, oh, you're fine, blah blah blah. Here's some here's some painkillers. Yeah. Well, he, the amount of painkillers he prescribed at the refills were like, you want me to live off painkillers for the next two years? That's mm-hmm. not happening. Yeah. So, and it progressively got worse and it got worse. And the way the system worked was you would, were supposed to email your doctor and they had, you know, 24 hours to respond to you. Yeah. If there was anything, well, over the course of like two and a half weeks, I'd emailed my doctor four times because it was mm-hmm. getting bad. I was getting really bad. I'm like, I could barely walk. Yeah. I couldn't really use my right hand and my right foot. So um, I was still trying to work because we're stubborn. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I was on the roof of a two-story house and I fell. I didn't fall off. I caught myself on a chimney and I'm laying on this roof. And it took me like 20 minutes before I could get up because I just didn't have the strength. I just couldn't get up. Yeah. And I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm in the north end of the county. There's no one around. And nobody really even knows where I'm at. Yeah. It's making sense. I'm sitting there. I could have died just now. Yeah. By the time I got off that roof, mind you, it took me like 45 minutes. By the time I got off that roof, I was, I was mad. I was really mad mm-hmm. and probably not thinking straight. Well, mm-hmm. I know I wasn't thinking straight because I emailed my doctor again. Now, so this would be not email number five with no response in theory, but I got a response. I got a response really quick. <laughs> um, not necessarily proud of the words I used, but I shouldn't have had to use them. Yeah. Yeah. The words I put in that email is I pretty much said where I'm at, like physically where I'm at. This is what's going on. This is what's happening. And this is what's bad. And my final words in that email was, I guess one dose of nine millimeter will fix this pain. Mm. Um, I got a lot. But the problem is, Gunny, I, I'm not really positive right to this day mm-hmm. that I didn't mean it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I think a part of me meant it. And that's the bad part that mm-hmm. it took that to get attention yeah and And, and that's what when i finally got help it wasn't through you know a navy doctor when i finally got someone i could talk to it was actually through the guy who was assigned to do my physical therapy he was the one who was in charge of my physical therapy he seen me one day and he said like look what's what's going on something's wrong something's different and he actually stopped my therapy and took me into the office and talked to me and said okay Wow. He's the one who literally, I say, I say, saved my life. Yeah, definitely. So it comes from everywhere. You know, it, can, it can be anywhere. I just yeah. found the right person at the right time um, who done his job right. So, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, there's things out there. But now, and again, I've I've learned a lot from that. And if it helps that I can possibly see it in somebody else and steer them the right direction and do something else, well, then you know, everything for a reason. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it, you know, you're not the the first veteran I talked to uh, that that had dealt with stuff like that and uh, have really had the same thoughts that you had at that point. Um, and, and fortunately, there was always somebody there uh, to be able to help them. You know, and like you said, it it comes in many different forms, uh, di- different people. And it's not always going to be the doc. Uh, especially yeah, in the military, dealing with the military docs, you know, unfortunately, it, it's not a smooth process all the, all the time. No, and it's it's not always their fault either. They they have their limits and they're stretched to the freaking limits. Oh, yeah. um, you know, very true. Everything's not Chicago Med. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. <That's laughs> yeah right. I look at that and I'm going, why have I never had a doctor like that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no. So, but yeah. it's oh, it's a uh, it. It would be hard for me, though, and, and it's hard for me to tell my son that, you know, because obviously today's Navy is totally different from the uh-huh. Navy I went in. Yeah. There are much better things in some areas, and there's much worse things, in my opinion, in some areas. I'd agree um, with that, yeah. There's always, there's always room for improvement in everything. Yeah. There's also, there's also changes that we make that, you know, aren't always for the best. Yeah, that's um, very true. Which, yeah. Again, and only time can always tell that truth, but... Mm-hmm. We loved our service. I mean, I look and I don't, I'm not one of the people that, you know, live that every day as far as I want everybody to know everywhere I go. You know, I don't wear my, you know, retired Navy ball caps around. Right. I, don't do, I, I don't do that. Um, 
uh, we cruise a lot and I always take the opportunity because on every cruise, at least on carnival cruise ships, they always have a military uh, gathering. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And so and I always go to those and I typically always speak at those. Um, a, recognize my wife and son's service and, and to let people know that there are there are services and other things and help is available in a lot of places that you may not think they are. It's there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And just the fact that we're all you know in the same room together. It's uh -huh. That's so we do that, but I am not the person that walks around all the time, you know, looking for somebody to acknowledge that I was in the service. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I think, well, I'm, I'm usually told, well, we don't have to, we can just look at you and know. Yeah. Like, well, <laughs> my hair is still, you know, my, my hair would pass marine standards still, by the way. Yeah. Um, nice. Okay. okay. Because I'm old and I just can't do it. I just think, yeah. what? But my hair gets a little bit. No, my God, no, I can't do this. It's got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Get that shaved on the sides. Yeah. Oh, that's so, funny. Yeah. That's, oh, no, it's been that way forever. And I was like, it starts to go, you know, half an inch long on the side. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. So it drives me crazy. Oh, uh, so people, awesome. Why do you still have that haircut? Um, because <laughs> well, I do have, I do have a little goatee now, though, but, okay. uh, you know. All right. And until until recently, when those rare times that we like go cruise or put on the uniform, uh -huh. and I've worn it a few times, I would always you know shave the goatee completely yeah, off. I got yeah. it. But recently, the standards or the rules have changed that retirees can actually still have a beard and still be wear the uniform. Oh no, kidding! So, yes, yeah. which was interesting when I found that out. I'm going, well, I guess I don't have to shave because yeah. I had people tell me before that, well, you're retired. What are they going to say to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has to say anything. I know what the standards are, and I won't wear mm -hmm. it outside of standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, but now that I know I'm allowed to wear it with a goatee as a retiree, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's that, yeah. it's it's amazing that the different changes that have happened uh, just recently, even with uh, yeah. like uh, facial hair and stuff like that. There's there's people walking around with uh, beards and stuff. Now they have to keep it nice and trim and all that type of stuff. But I've seen them walking around with beards. Uh, well, you know, when I came in, when I was a junior sailor in, in Hawaii, I had a beard. No kidding. Yeah, we were allowed to have beards. Wow. Yeah, yeah, we could have a beard in those days. So I see it just came full circle. That's, that's what happened. Yeah, it came. Of course, you know, the uniform has changed, at least the Navy. The Navy I mean, several times, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I can't count how many times. It was, I'm pretty sure it's because somebody has a, you know, some politician has a, a clothing manufacturer in their district and they got an ability to, hey, they're making this new uniform. We're changing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, it, it, it has happened happen. quite a bit. Yeah, you know the one like that one jacket that is the warmest jacket ever. It's the best coat. The, They're gonna the, take that one away because well, you never have to replace it because it's too good. It doesn't wear out. It's just warm. No, we're gonna give you this cheap one that wears out, and you have to keep buying new ones. Yeah, dang yeah, it, yeah. we like that jacket. You know, everybody loved that one coat. Nope, we're not wearing that one anymore. Yeah, <sighs> yeah, you're talking yeah. about the pea coat, right? Oh, well, no, the peacoat we still had, but there was a, there was, I remember an old green work jacket we had that, dear oh, I see. Okay. that thing was the best jacket ever. Nope, can't wear those anymore. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. always tend to, yeah, it's always the warm things they tend to change on you. Yes, and they make them thinner material or something that's going to rip easy or yeah. just wear out. It was, yeah, I mean, fortunately, oh, Marines gosh. didn't go through some of the uniforms that the Navy went through. Yeah, I, we in my time in, we only had one. Uh, uniform change. It was when we went from the old, uh, the tricolor camis uh, to the new digital camis. Well, it's not new anymore, uh, yeah. but the digital camis, and we haven't changed since. Like it's always been the same. Um, yeah. So you, I, know, you know, I just had the one uniform change. Uh, the dress <laughs> uniform was always the same. Service uniform was always the same. Well, you know, actually, when I came in, the you know the standard old school Navy Cracker Jack uniform, as they called it, yeah, yeah, yeah. was not. When I first came in, it had been gone for a little while. Mm -hmm. Our 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 boot camp company was one of the first ones to get reissued the the Cracker Jacks again. They brought them back. Oh, okay. Well, our dungaree or our utility work uniform, I went through. Now you had probably, the you wore the uh, bell bottom ones, right? Oh, I had the bell bottom ones yeah. at one point. The blue bell bottoms that look like denim that were yeah skin tight. And then you had these utility things that made you look like you were working for the um, telephone company that were absolutely <laughs> horrible, horrible. Um, and then we changed to, God, we went through like four different versions of the working uniform for E6 and below. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, and you're trying to figure out 
why? I don't know what we're doing. Why are we doing this? Yeah. So, and of course, <laughs> yeah. they buy all the uniforms. You know, yeah. the army they changed up their uniforms too. They don't have the, or they're not issuing out the their dress blue uniform. Uh, really? They they went to the old pinks and greens. So that's all there. I think they look good. Yeah, uh, me personally. I don't, I don't know if I've seen them. I don't, I don't think it's really. You'll have to look it up. Remember, it's it's I mean, like from. Uh, oh, oh man, I'm trying to think when. Like World War Two era, I think, uh, and before, but oh, the, the old right. pinks and greens is what they call it. But uh, it's a it's a sharp looking uniform. I in fact, I think it's probably the best uniform that they've they've had in a long time. Well, I have to look at that because I always think, well, obviously your you know, your Marine Class A's are pretty impressive, but you know, I'm sorry, nothing beats that if if worn properly, nothing beats the choker whites. That's just they do look dead. sharp, yeah. If Absolutely. they're worn properly, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, true. Uh, but yeah, you're yeah. right. Now, keeping that clean, I'm glad that uh, oh, we, God, they're dirt staff and CEOs and officers, you get to wear the white trousers, and that's hard enough to keep clean. I couldn't imagine yeah. having the whole thing being white. I, I'd be oh, yeah. yeah, those are literally dirt magnets, as we call them. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. yeah. Oh, All right, well, well, hey, Doug, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, I want to tell you from me to you, uh, you've done a heck of a job, uh, not only for the military, but uh, with your family, uh, knowing your son and, and how well he's done. You guys have done a fantastic job. Uh, so thanks for what you've done for the country. Thanks for what you've done for your son, even. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to talk to you uh, during this whole podcast. Well, I appreciate it, and I'm I'm going to have a toast of this nice quality of bourbon here to you. So, Awesome. All right. Well, hey, Doug, thank you very much to all the listeners out there. Stay motivated. Change your socks. To all the listeners out there, I want to thank you for joining us on today's podcast. As a reminder for all veterans, if you are struggling and need assistance in any way, please reach out for help. The VA has an incredible website and helplines to assist you in your time of need. Just go to the veteranscrisisline.net. That's the veteranscrisisline.net. There are several ways of reaching out for assistance through the VA. For a crisis emergency, just dial 988 and then press 1. Again, dial 988 and then press 1. You can also chat online by going to veteranscrisisline.net and clicking on the chat icon. You can also text for assistance at 838-255. Again, that's 838-255. All calls are confidential and you only have to discuss what you feel comfortable discussing. If you are in need of help, don't hesitate to call. You matter to me and all of your veteran community. One veteran suicide is one too many. Thanks again for tuning in. Don't forget... There are new episodes of the Lost Art with Andrew Cox podcast daily, Monday through Friday. Stay motivated and change your socks.